Thanks everyone for the warm welcome. Um, yeah, as Liam introduced, I am Taylor Thomas, um, and this is choosing custom customizability and distributing dependencies with WASM components. So who am I? Just a quick thing. Um, that little icon on the right is something that actually Bailey, who was just speaking, generated, and it's very cursed looking, but it's kind of hilarious. So she, she generated it because I do a lot of rest and I'm always wearing a hat. So. Um, she generated that to, to make it. So that, that's the picture. But yeah, I'm an engineering director at Cosmonic. I am a serial open source contributor and Wasm Cloud maintainer. I've done a lot of stuff in Kubernetes. I was a Helm maintainer for a long time, all those kind of things. Um, I'm also uh, one of the co-chairs of the CNCF Wasm working group. Um, so I do a lot of work over there in, in that side of things. And as I said, I'm our station. So I do a lot of, of rest. I come from doing a lot of Go before that as well. And then, you know, we all kind of touch all the languages at some point. So what's the agenda today? You'll notice this is really short because, and there's a reason why I have this up here because I'm gonna be doing some things like live right in front of you and I'll explain why. So let's talk about the component model. Now some of these slides I'm gonna show are actually the same as Bailey's and that's on purpose. Number one, this is recorded and people might watch it later. And number two, I wanted to drive home the point. So first off, this is just the quick overview of what the component model provides. You heard Bailey just barely talk a lot about this. And the main thing is that it is interface driven and I'll explain a little bit more about that, but it boils down to Everything is interface driven. As a developer, you have interface driven development and as a platform operator, you operate your platform via interfaces and what you expose to your developers. You get SDKs for free. That's the whole uh, other selling point that we, we really talk about. I'll give some examples of that. And then there's this cool thing called virtual platform layering. So let me dig into some of those points. So. This is the slide that Bailey showed, and I want to drive this home again. We jokingly call these little things on either end the nubs. Um, they fit into other nubs. And so what it all boils down to is you have an interface that says, I am using logging. I am using a key value. I am using whatever it is. And you don't have to worry about the implementation details on the other side. So this means, you know, that code, uh, everyone, this is a CNCF conference, everyone's probably written at least a little go. We've all copy pasted those same 20 lines of HTTP server code and reconfigured them. Let's be honest with ourselves. There's no more of that because those things are now externalized from what you're actually doing. So how do you satisfy an interface? There's four different ways you can satisfy an importer and export inside of these, these WIT files that you've been seeing. One of them is locally, and so we do that like in Wasm Cloud with things that are embedded in the runtime. There's a composed component, which are, which we'll show a little bit more of. There is an optimized process external to the host, which I will also show. Um, once I, and then distributed compo component will do any of those three things. So you're gonna kind of see it. This is an example of what we do inside of Wasm Cloud. Wasm Cloud is a CNCF project. It should be incubating relatively soon. It is a, um, a distributed system for running WebAssembly. So whoever asked the question about does networking matter, this is the kind of answer to this. Uh, so we can do this in a distributed way or a local way. Now for the SDKs for free, this is another thing that Bailey showed, but I think it actually applies for this as well. You can write, we okay, once again, CNCF conference. Remember those early days of using client go and then the JavaScript library popped up and then this library popped up and this library popped up and they all work slightly differently. It's so fun, isn't it, right? And when there's no longer any of that. In a, in a world where components exist, the, the go client would be it. Everyone would use that through a set of interfaces. And so that strictly divine interface makes it really easy to consume it and reuse these libraries. Now, let's talk about Wazivert. So Wazivert is a project that is meant to be an easy to use project or easy to use library to do virtual platform layering. Now what virtual platform layering is, is it says, hey, I work at a big company and this needs to go through a specific proxy and I can layer something in and say, this is now going to go through a proxy. The developer didn't have to know about the proxy. There's no proxy settings that they had to set any of that. Or you could be saying, oh, file system access. Well, you might not want to grant file system access to your root nodes or whatever there might be. So you abstract that away and give it an in-memory one, or it could even be doing HTTP calls under the hood. It doesn't really matter. And so it also allows you to configure things. And that's another way of, of putting this is you can say, I'm gonna configure how my environment is gonna operate by layering on something on top of it. Now just, I also wanna call out a huge shout out to Guy Bedford who wrote this project. Um, and he did, a he did a great job. We're gonna see a little bit of this today. But to explain a little bit more clearly about how this works. 
So we have this component that we've written, and it might have things like I need to um, import WASI IO or WASI file system or the environment, or I need to get HTTP. And all of those things, especially IO and file system, I could want to abstract that away. I could make it an in-memory file system, or I could pass in like a foobar environment variable. And so what that does is it glues it together, and it says, I'm going to do it. And so what your new component looks like is this. So you end up with essentially four things it's trying to import, but then when you're finally gonna run this, if you virtualized away these things, you end up with a single export. WASI HTTP, which is exactly what you want. This is very, very powerful because you can layer it multiple times, time and time and again, to get whatever thing you need. It's a very powerful and core concept of the component model that we're gonna see today. So to learn more about the component model, this is a QR code that leads to a talk by Luke Wagner. Luke Wagner is the guy who invented WebAssembly. He's a big, uh, big leader in the space. He's done a bunch of stuff with the, the component model. He gives a very in-depth explanation of all this. Extremely good, highly recommend. It's a great talk to watch later today or tonight. Okay, so something to understand before we jump into these demos. Wasm Cloud 1.0, which is what we're releasing right now, we have our alpha branches out, is components native. So everything it does follows all the standards, and it means anything you use on it can be used with anything else that uses the standards. The whole goal of, of the component model in the first place. So now we're gonna to go to demos. This QR code goes to the code I am going to show. I am not necessarily going to dive deep into code because not everybody is familiar with Rust and that's what I wrote this in because I'm most comfortable in it. But also, it's we're talking about interface-driven development. So I'm gonna show a little bit of it, but don't worry too much about the details. So we're gonna go ahead and start. And the reason I'm doing this is we keep saying the component model's cool, the component model's cool, and everybody's like, okay, that's great. I'm gonna show it to you. This is all live on stage. I'm, I'm gonna be coding this, building it, running it all in front of you to show you that this is very real and can be used right now. So I'm gonna start off with a simple um, HTTP demo. So this is going to be the, the simplest of simple, but I'm gonna start off by looking at wit. So like Bailey showed in her talk, there is a world. A world says, this is the environment I'm targeting. And this one is incredibly simple. It says, all I need, can everybody see this by the way? I can make it even bigger, but um, this says, I am going to export an, an incoming handler. So I'm going to be an HTTP server. Nothing else, that's all it says that I want to have. So I'm gonna go ahead and build this. Now something you, know, you can note in here when I'm building this is, I'm going to be using the, uh, the basically the Wasm Cloud tool chain. Now, I, I call that out for a very specific reason. So I'm going to call wash build. This is just calling some cargo build stuff underneath the hood. And it built and made this component. This component I'm going to show run in a couple different ways. So let's go ahead and start by looking at what the final output of this looks like. So there's this cool tool called Wasm Tools, um, component wit. And I'm going to take a look at the, um, the output of this. Oop, wasm tools, not tool. So this right here that you'll see in my terminal is what the final output world looks like. To make this work in, in the uh, preview two, the preview 0.2 thing that, um, that Bailey was showing off, you have to have a few of these imports added in. But you'll see a couple of imports and you'll still see that exact thing we asked for, which is the export HTTP incoming handler. So I'm gonna start this first in Wasm Cloud. I have a host running on my machine. This is being done local, but to be very clear, everything I'm about to show could be distributed. Each of these co components could be different, running in a different part of the world. That's another demo that we've shown many times and I can show you later if you come stop by the Wasm Cloud booth uh, during the conference. So I'm gonna go ahead and start this and um, pull over this. So I'm just starting from a file because I'm starting this locally and I'm calling this this HTTP hello component. So I'm starting it inside of Wasm Cloud. We'll give it a second. It started up and now I'm going to start something called a provider. So you remember that uh, that diagram I showed you earlier. I'm going to show it to you again. But there's that one little import that's left. It needs to have an HTTP server. So what I'll go ahead and do, if I can get my mouse, there we go is I'm gonna go ahead and start what we call a provider. It's another type of component that's uh, stateful and allows you to spin up an HTTP server. So I've spun that up. 
Now I'm going to give it a little bit of config because I need to tell it, like, you need to listen on a port. This is very similar to, like, a config map in Kubernetes. Like, it, oops, that's, whoa. Not what I was trying to do. Um, so I just put some config, like a config map. Now this is the key thing. Because we're running in Wasm Cloud, we can allow for dynamic linking. We could hot swap this to another HTTP provider of some kind, or we could, you know, patch a bug. Doesn't really matter what we decide to do, but I'm gonna go ahead and take that and run it right here with this link. So you'll actually see that the HTTP server started on my machine, proof that this is real. And I'm, I'm telling it to link to that interface that I exposed. Okay, so now this is all done, and I can actually come over here and say curl 881, and you're gonna get hello from Rust. Simple hello world example. Um, like I said, I'm not gonna show too much code, but the code for this is very simple. This is gonna be made even more simple as we improve the experience, but it is just saying, hey, I'm gonna handle a request, and then I'm gonna write out a body to it, so very straightforward. Now, let's go back to a diagram here. So this is what I just showed. So Wasm Cloud is satisfying WASI CLI environment, all those other imports that it's requesting. But then there is a, an HTTP call. We use something called WRPC, which is um, WIT over RPC. Um, it is a protocol that can be, it's fairly, fairly transparent. We use it over NETs, and this thing is being sent to an HTTP server. In this case, it's just running on my same machine and it, it's very fast, but like that, this can be running anywhere. So that's the first thing we did. Now, like I said, I built this with the Wasm, uh, Wasm Cloud tool chain, but this is something that can run anywhere. So there is a Wasm runtime, which is very, it's kind of the, one of the more general purpose runtimes out there called Wasm time. So I'm gonna go ahead and take Wasm time serve, and this is going to take the, you'll see it's the exact same component I started, build HTTP hello world, and I'm gonna start it. Okay, you'll notice it's now running, and if I come over to another tab and I do curl on 8080, hello from Rust. Exactly what you saw before. So I just took something that was running in Wasm Cloud. It's not locked in. You can take it and move it somewhere else. So all we did in this case for the, di for the diagram is we took Wasm Time instead. And we said Wasm Time is actually providing the HTTP import for it. Really also just a straightforward thing. It's just saying I need something to plug in there. So let's go ahead and go to the next part of this. So the next thing I did was say, let's, let's make this more difficult than just an HTTP server. Let's add in a database. Okay, that's always a fun thing. So let's go to our WIT again. You'll see here we imported something different. You'll see at the very top we have some logging. We're gonna start logging some things and we also have this key value atomic. So now I am importing an interface from a key value, a standard key value interface we're working on in, is part of what's called WASI Cloud and we're pulling that in. And then when we build this, we're going to, to use that and we're gonna increment a, key, a number inside of a key value store and return that every single time. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, build that. So let me come back over here and do it. So I will build this as well. Okay, that's all built and good to go. And now I'm going to change which component is running inside of Wasm Cloud. So you're gonna see this in Wasm Cloud again. So I'm just changing which thing it's using to be this latest thing that I just built, okay, and it's updated. So now I need to have something that satisfies that key value import. So once again, because this is Wasm Cloud, I'm gonna go ahead and start this as another provider. And we're gonna use Redis. So I just have a Redis server running locally. It's in this tab right here in case you don't believe me. Um, there's a Redis server running locally. And I'm gonna give it a little bit of config too. This is where you'd pass in connection strings or whatever. And notice that it's entirely external. As a platform operator, which is the role I'm playing right here, I'm gonna come in and I'm going to give it some config. I'm telling it to connect to local host because I'm running everything local. And then I'm gonna go ahead and take this, uh, this link I'm about to put in right here. And I'm gonna say, please link to that atomic interface, these two different components. So I'm dynamically linking it in place. Okay, now that's all ready. And if I go ahead and I curl this, hey, we're getting an incrementing number. Okay, that's pretty awesome. Now we're talking to a database. So we just added another layer of complexity, yet it's still all behind interfaces. So let's go ahead and keep going on with that. What happens if I try to run this component inside of Wasm time? Oh no, what are we ever to do? This is where the component model comes in. 
It's saying, hey, I, I don't have these things you're asking for. What am I supposed to do here? So we can do that by virtualizing it away. And in this case, because I'm running it locally, I'm going to go to something that we call our, a mock KV. So this mock KV, if we look at, it, look at its wit, you're going to see something a little bit different. You'll see that it's exporting the logging import that I need from the other thing, and it's exporting a key value atomic, and it's importing from the file system. So this component is going to put key values, on, like the value of a key on the, the file system. That's what it's gonna do. Just something super dumb. But this is a mock KV. This could be another um, implementation that forwards an HTTP request to another type of database. This could be any number of things. But in this case, I'm just gonna build something super straightforward. So I'll go up to that mock KV, and I'll go ahead and wash build that. And over here, we now are going to introduce one more tool. This syntax is a little complex, I know that, but I'm going to show it just so you know what it is. There's a cool tool called WAC. Um, now this is a tool that was built by um, Peter Hewn in the WebAssembly community. And WAC is a way, it's a superset of WIT that allows you to say how things are going to be composed together. Now there's a lot going on here, you don't have to understand it all, but essentially what it boils down to is I'm going to say, hey, I have this new mock KV, the, the thing that I just created, that, that other way I showed you, and I have my hello KV thing that I've been doing, and you'll see that I'm putting in logging right there for it, and I'm putting in atomic right up here. So I'm satisfying, I'm providing an export that that thing can consume, and I'm gluing it together. So what happens is now I can come over here, and I can, um, we like to call it whack it, you whack it together, um, that's a fun name. So we're gonna go ahead and whack it together. And it's now output at this output.wasm. So if I go ahead and I do the uh, component lookup for the wit, you'll see, so actually I'll show before and after. So we'll go ahead and do build HTTP hello world. And you'll see that we have these three types on the imports right now saying, hey, I'm importing these three things. And if you look at what we just created, you'll see that we ended up with none of those imports in there anymore. So now if I do wasm time serve, and I go over here and I curl it again, you'll see that I now have an incrementing key value store. So I went from erroring out to patching over that dependency. What does this look like? Something very similar. So in this case, wasm time is still providing all the same things that it did before, but now I took my KV file implementation, my, my mock file server, I remember mock KV, and I put it in and glued it in, and now we have a whole component again. It doesn't need anything else to be able to run. So inside of what we did in, in Wasm Cloud, we ended up with something that looked like this, right? The same things are still satisfied, but in this case, it's going to an external dynamically de linked dependency. So just to emphasize this again, it is the exact same component. I did not change anything. All I did was layer on what was needed for this to actually function. And I'm doing this, like I said, this is all live right in front of you. I'm not, I'm not fudging any of this. This is actually how it works. So let's take it one step further. Let's say I want to add in a custom interface. So I've been showing ones that are all standards. And a lot of people have these standards just kind of built into their host. We generally don't take that approach. We have these external dependencies. But what if I have a custom interface I want to build? So let's go back to the wit again. So if I come over here to my HTTP hello3, I added a new interface called Pong. We're keeping it simple today, but this could be anything. This is just a simple ping pong. I call ping, it returns the pong of some string value. But it's entirely custom. This is not defined anywhere. This is something I just wrote. And I'm going to look at my world and say, hey, I have that key value atomic, but I'm also importing ping pong which is that new interface I defined. So now when I actually build this, what I do is I can come over and build it over here. Okay, so that's built, and I'm actually gonna go ahead and run it, but before we do anything, I'm going to, come, um, I'm going to go ahead and actually show you what we're gonna do with this. So I will update it, but we're gonna stop there. And I'm gonna show you what we have to do. So you'll notice that we have now this dangling import that we have to do. So what we 
can go do is now create a Pong, something that implements it. So if we look at the WIT here and we look at the world, you'll see that it's importing WASI CLI environment and it's exporting the example of ping pong. Now this is one place I'll show you the code again really quickly because it's very fast and it matters for the next example. Right here, we're creating a component that it exports this ping interface for something to call and it is using the environment to find an environment variable called pong so I can configure what the, the variable is going to say for it. So that's, that's how this is being set up. So once again, I'm gonna go ahead and go up to Pong and I'm going to wash build it. Now let's go ahead and take a look at what this wit looks like. So you'll see here, we have all the, the imports we've been seeing, but that WASI CLI environment is something I explicitly called for. In a highly distributed multi-tenant system like Wasm Cloud, we don't expose environment variables to people, and that's gonna be a common use case. It could be it's not available on your system, it could be that it's too small. So I don't, if I try to run this right now, it's gonna call and we're, we, we stub out the import and say you're not allowed to do this by default. So I'm going to say, how do we get around this? Well, this is where that tool Wasi Vert comes in. So Wasi Vert allows us to do this with these common set of interfaces, and it's something that we hope to be able to expand into things like Wasi Cloud. So what I did with the key value store can be done later in, in, in the future. So I'm gonna take Wasi Vert, and what I'm doing is I'm saying, take build Pong, which is what I just built. I'm allowing random because I know that on our system, I, I need this because I, I've built it, but also we have a secure, um, a secure way of generating this so that it's not going to be a security issue. And then I am going to manually pass in an environment variable called Pong called with Wasmday, and I'm going to output this to a new component. So now I have this vert.wasm, and if I go ahead and do vert.wasm, there we go, You'll notice all of those, those imports went away. All that's here now is I'm importing random and I'm exporting ping pong. So now this component has been entirely virtualized away from all of those CLI things. It's not allowed to do anything else. So now for, for our cases in the demo, in Wasm Cloud, I start this as another component. So I'll go ahead and grab my component here. And I'm gonna start it. We'll give it a second to start up. Okay, now my Pong is set up, and then I have to dynamically link it again. So now I've linked this, it's all it's all put together, and if I come, if I go ahead and curl it, you're gonna see I got Pong Wasm Day, which is that value that I just set right here. Th that's what I was talking about, this config element. So I've progressively built this up to now we've now we're using custom interfaces. But once again, how is Wasm time going to do this? What is, what is it supposed to do? Well, in this case, we can literally just glue those components together. What we just did distributed, I'm now going to do local by gluing together. So if I come back over here, I'm going to use that WAC syntax again. This one's the most complex because it's gluing everything together. But essentially, you can see down here at the bottom, I have, hey, this example ping pong thing is getting pulled in by my, by my pong component that I'm pulling in for this composition. So when I come over here, and this is one I definitely copied because it's a long command. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna glue this all together and output it to output.wasm. Oh, I need to go up a directory, sorry. Okay, so now I've built this output.wasm. And if I go ahead and do the output, or actually I'll go ahead and, and run this, I'll go wasm time serve output.wasm. So now it's serving on 8080. And I come back over here, I'm getting the exact same thing. So I just took this component to review. I took the component and I'll actually show you the diagram. I took the component and I have Wasm time taking care of all the things it satisfies. Then I have Wasi key value um, that's being satisfied by my custom component I created. And then the Ponger thing that I created with Wasi vert on top of that to make sure that it can't access the environment. And all of these things I was able to satisfy and put in all together here. Now, once again, Wasm time is a stand-in for any other standards compliant system. If someone else has implemented these standards, this exact thing I showed you, you can run there. And all of this can be done right now with tooling. As I said, we're, this is using the alpha tooling of Wasm Cloud that'll soon be, be full 1.0, but this is something that can be used anywhere you want to. So 
That is pretty much it for my demos. If you want to learn more about this, there is the component tutorial that, that uh, Bailey already mentioned, and you can come meet, I'll be over at the Cosmonic booth or the Wasm Cloud booth talking about this today. So with that, where am I at on time? Actually fairly decent. So any questions? Uh, Taylor, I, got a, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're using this WAC tool, uh, to me, as a, it sounded a little bit like the Unix pipe. You know, that you were just taking these components and you, back to that Unix philosophy, you were just infinitely chaining them together. Is yes. That, is that a good analogy? Yeah. Essentially, by the end, if we go back to this diagram, that's a chain of like three or four things that it's going through to make sure it gets the right value. Let's so stay here for just a yeah. second. Now, but what's different, though, is that each one of these components that you're chaining through isn't a sitting on full POSIX, right? It just has the only, the just the little worlds, uh, Deny by default, you know, yeah. care nothing. Yes, right? that's exactly right. So if you look at the, if remember that last wit example I showed with the Pong component, that was two things. It imported one thing and exported one thing. There was none of, when we talked about the idea of libc, you're not exposing the 500 functions of libc with that, you're exposing one thing. And it's three functions, I think, that are inside of get random. And that's, that's much more secure. It's a very lightweight security footprint. Yeah, so each one of these are still separate WebAssembly modules with separate memory, linear space, and all the... All the Ex yes, exactly. And they can be reused. If you're using Pong or somewhere else in a different way, I can pass you that interface or this exact component. You can use it in that place. Last question, then I'll turn over to the audience. And then this is all within a single process, right? That what Bailey was saying earlier, so this is all nanoseconds between components, right? Yes, this is very fast. That's incredible. Quick question, um, maybe can you share some insights how the debugging process would look like, especially if you have uh, cross-component calls and so on? How would this experience feel? Yeah, so those components, I could actually probably scroll back in some of my, my shell history right there and, and show you some of the output. That's something that's being actively worked on in the community. It isn't super great right now, uh, but it it does it is very clear when something goes wrong. So last night I was trying to figure out why something wasn't working, and it gave me a detailed list. Now I had to read through the list of things, but once I read it, I could see okay, this call is failing because it hasn't been authorized with the proper link or it hasn't been put together. And so all those things are there. Um, but you're, the thing is, you're still building. Like when I was showing that stuff in Rust, I'm still building with the Rust tool chain. I can still use all the Rust things. It's once it's compiled is where we're working on the what things we can do. But because everything's standard, you can start to see where you could extend onto those types of things. Something very interesting that I saw in the very first, or maybe it was the second slide, where you had the definition of the interface, mm -hmm. is that it looked very much uh, like Rust. And one of the types was parameterized and it mm -hmm. was like a borrow of a string. Yep. Does this mean that these interfaces not only define the shape of the data that's being transported, but also like ownership uh, semantics? Yes, it does do ownership semantics. That's a really great deep technical question. So the reason why that's there is when you're sharing things that have different linear memories is what it's called, the different memory spaces you want to make sure that you have you know exactly who owns it so that's indicating to the underlying code that that basically lifts and lowers these types from the numbers in a trench coat bailey mentioned those those things are lifted and lowered and they have to know that like this is owned by somebody somewhere so when you say borrow it's saying you do not own this you cannot dispose of it and so that way you don't end up with any things where something is you're freeing resources that something else is using so that ownership semantic has to be there but it doesn't really sh it's kind of under the hood for languages that don't necessarily have that semantic built into them okay thank you very much Hi, um, I work on the Manage Mesh team at mm -hmm. Salesforce, so I, I think a lot about sidecars. And uh, what I'm thinking about watching this talk is like, okay, so we have these composable components, and what's stopping people from just creating a component that is their application, and then a component that is a sidecar, essentially, mm -hmm. linking them together, and using that to implement the sidecar pattern instead of using containers themselves, which would then have that you know, inter-networking uh, inner container networking aspect to it. Is there any aspect to NATs or any of the cross-host communication between WASM modules that are just running, forgive me for the ignorance, like natively on the machine, yeah. um, that would stop you know this sort of conversation from getting started? 
No, that's exactly the use case we've talked about with many people who are especially running Kubernetes and sidecar patterns right now, is that you can glue it together. And that's actually something we already put experimental support for, but not fully in Wasm Cloud, is if it's running locally, it can just be routed locally. And then if it's going to something remote, then it gets sent over our, our networking layer, which is NATS. And so it does not preclude any of those things because, like I mentioned, this is all components standards compliant. So anything you build, you can run with or without that, that transparent layer that we have in between. So it would work for that sidecar pattern without much of a hassle. That's really cool. One more really quick annoying question. What was the terminal you were using? Uh, that's warp. Warp. Thank you. Um, just to, to come back, uh, there's a WIT cheat sheet that's floating around. You know, WIT is a larger domain than what you think about, than what you have with, uh, say, OpenAPI, for example, uh, because it's designed to do some abstractions that kind of bridge into thinking about operating system context. Um, so the, if you, and if you check the component model uh, docs earlier, there's a great link uh, in some WIT education there. First of all, I very much like seeing uh, a NATS as a message broker or like a networking layer here. It's, it's a very cool technology. Uh, to do multi-region, would you then use a supercluster or how do you do that? Yes. So for those not familiar with NATS, NATS has a very flexible uh, di uh, distribution and um, creation of its topologies and how you, can, how you can put it out there and deploy it. So the uh, supercluster is one where you have multiple clusters that are part of a bigger cluster. And yes, any of those will work. So you just have to shape your NATS cluster to be the traffic for whatever you do, cross region, cross zone, cross whatever you're going to do, which we have done at scale with multiple uh, open source users and then Cosmonic customers as well. Do you also then use multiple accounts to, to do multi-tenancy and stuff? Yeah, and that's something I think we can probably bring to the hallway track right after this and I can give you some more of the details because that's a, it's, we know a lot about that. Cool. So. Great. Uh, okay. We've got time for a few more questions here, Taylor. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, any direction for uh, uh, socket-based communication between uh, WASM components and modules for streaming data? For streaming data? Yeah, so there's actually a concept of streams inside of WIT. So the I, I can actually show that in the code. So the stuff that you were seeing there with the HTTP is actually stream-based. So if I come back here and go to the Rust code for this, and I hide this, you can actually see down here that there is an output stream that it uses and an input stream that comes in through this incoming request that gets our body. Um, so the incoming request is an actual stream that I can then, or a thing that I can take the stream from and read body data out. Um, there's going to be another demo on here later that shows those streams in action with a blob store. Um, I won't say more than that, but that's one of the, towards the end of the day uh, today. But you do have streams that are native parts of WIT specifically for those things. Okay, maybe time for one more question. Okay, please join me in thanking Taylor for an awesome talk. Thanks, everyone.